following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. All right. The wheel of samsara. Retribution. They are kind of numbered 10, which is related with the letter, the Hebrew letter Yod. We are arriving at the very bottom of the tree of life, according to with the ten sephirah, which is a sephirah malkut, the kingdom, which in relation with the four worlds of Kabbalah, four manifested worlds, is the world of Asia, the world of matter in action. In many of the lectures, we always refer to the laws of evolution and involution. And here, of course, when we explain the descent or the ray of creation from the ains of ore down into Malkut, we call it involution. The way in which the forces of the ray of creation descend into matter in different dimensions. To finally arrive uh, to the three-dimensional world, which is the world in which we live. In the previous lectures, we explained this, that uh, our planet is uh, baptized with the name of Earth. And we explained that it is called Earth because according with the cosmic rounds or involution of the matter, into the different uh, dimensions to finally arrive to the three-dimensional world, it takes, of course, a series of events or 
involvements of the array of creation in different dimensions. What? Mm -hmm. So, we said in other lectures that in Kabbalah, we talk about the three main letters related with the elements, air, fire, and water, which are Aleph, Shin, and Mem. And uh, each of these letters is related Kabbalistically and Gnostically speaking, which three previous rounds, cosmic rounds, the first round which was related with the letter Aleph, the second round which was related with the letter Shin, the third related with the letter Mem. In other words, air, fire, water. Because now we are in the fourth round or fourth manifestation, we will say, of matter in this three-dimensional world, which is the terrestrial round. And that's why the planet Earth is called Earth. But it is the outcome of these three previous manifestations, according to the involution <coughs> of the ray of creation to finally arrive at this level in which we are. From here, we have to go up into the higher dimensions. And that is the involvement of the spirit into the matter in order to acquire knowledge, gnosis, in order to acquire knowledge of itself, because that is the objective of creation, to awake and to acquire knowledge of itself. The spirit itself, that in Kabbalah, in Hebrew, is called Elohim, of course, is a plural name, which means Gods and goddesses, attributes. And uh, each one of us has his own particular individual Elohim. So then, this Elohim acquired knowledge to the different rounds in order to return into the absolute, which is the unknowable city. When we talk about the absolute, which is beyond Keter, the crown, we find there, as you see in the tree of life in this picture, the Ain, the Ain Sof, and the Ain Sof Or, the three aspects of the unknowable divine. This unknowable divine is a city. Behold here that we are not saying deity, because deity is that word which is related to the manifested Elohim. But city is that which is unknowable, is not a deity, has no form, is related with the abstract, absolute space. This is precisely what uh, in Gnosticism we state Moses refers at Elohim. Elohim is the origin of Elohim. In Buddhism, Elohim received the name of Adi Buddha, and Elohim received the name of Buddha. So here we find, of course, that from Adi Buddha emerges Buddha. 
from Elohim emerges Elohim and is sent into the tree of life in order to manifest itself in different levels in every sephirah. But this is, of course, what we call the multiple perfect unity. When arriving at the level of Malkut, we have to study then how this ray of creation manifests, especially in this fourth round in which we are right now, especially in our terrestrial round, which the book of Genesis, written by Moses, explains in different steps. Because Genesis itself is a book of Kabbalah and Adgimi. That's why in the beginning, in Genesis, Moses uh, refers to two trees. The tree of life, which is this, ten sephirath, along with the 22 letters given by the, uh, uh, by the angel Methraton. And uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is that, the sephira of mystery, which means knowledge in Hebrew, which is gnosis in Greek. So the study of that and the tree of life got together because they are rooted in the same energy, which is the aim of or. The limitless light. This aims of or is it's necessary to state here that is called in Latin Lucifer, which means carrier of light or barrier of light. Is that light that starts from above and go down into the very nine sphere? in the center of the earth that in the previous lecture the former speaker referred to it in wild detail so that ends of or which is all noble become noble through one that, which is precisely here in this letter, or this card, or the ten, which is the letter Yod. The Yod is precisely that, that, which is Keter, the crown. And uh, in the meaning of that word, Yod, Hebrew, uh, Kabbalistic word, you find the explanation of how that yod develops and comes down into the matter. Because the letter yod is written with yod, vav, and dalet, which letters were already explained in previous lectures. So the yod is the dat that emerges from the unknowable and extends in the tree of life with the letter Vav to finally arrive at Dalet, which is the outcome of evolution or the objective, which is the terrestrial man. Because in Malkut, we find, of course, the philosophical earth, not only the planet earth, but the philosophical earth, and that philosophical earth is the human being itself, the terrestrial man. So when you read Earth in the Bible, sometimes it's referred to the planet itself and to the terrestrial man itself, the human being that lives in this three-dimensional world. Because in the level in which we are right now, we will say, according to evolution, that's the summit 
of evolution. Because remember that the ray of creation descends into the planet and start to evolve, to mean to return into its own source. Mechanically, it does it through the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, to finally arrive at the human kingdom. Or we will say, to, uh, to, to be more specific, to the level of the humanoid or intellectual animal, which has the privilege to keep ahead in rising in the, or returning that light and to create inside of him the human being, the true human being. And that, that light will return again. But that comes from, come from Dalet, which is the terrestrial man. And from that terrestrial man goes up into the different sephiroth. And that's how that light returns. But of course, the mechanical laws of nature, evolution, reaches only to the humanoid. Beyond that, we need the assistance of divinity. We need the assistance of that yod. But where, in which part of this Dalet or terrestrial man is that yod hidden? Kabbalistic, we said, is hidden within Tet. And we explain that Tet is related with Yesod, which is that serpent, or that fire that hides the Yod, the power of God, the power of Keter, the father of all the lights. And that Yod is in Yesod. And Yesod is the center, the ninth sphere. And behold here, to explain better, do you hear the word, or do you read the word Yesod in Hebrew? It's exactly a Yod, with the only difference that has a Samech, which is a serpent, eating its own tail, the sign of infinity. That's the only difference between Yod and Yesod. So this is how Yod, the word Yod, is hidden within Samech, the sign of the infinite. And that's why it is written that the symbol of Keter is a circle with a dot in the middle, which explains Yesod and Keter at the same time. And explains also how Malkut is related with the number 10. Because this Yod descends in all the Sephiroth to finally arrive to the 10th in order to make his own body, the body of Keter. But this Keter that comes from above becomes hidden within the serpent in the sexual force to finally return into his own source. And that's precisely the meaning of the whole creation. To return the force to his own source. Keter, Yod, has to return. But in the sex, is hidden in potentiality. Not in activity. In the same way that we have, for instance, the sperm and the ovum in our sexual organs. That each sperm and each ovum together, they have the capability or the potentiality or becoming a human being. If there is activity, which is a sexual act, and eventually sperm and the ovum will come a human being, physically speaking. In the same way, that potency is hidden within the sex 
and we know how to return and transform it inside of us, will go back and to attain and to uh, uh, the serialization of our own particular monad. This is how the Lord descends and helps us. That's why the letter 10 is related with EO. And this EO is a androgenism, lunar solar androgenism. The letter I, which reminds us the number one, is the man. And the letter O is the female, which is the uterus. By uniting EO, we have the number 10, meaning that between the man and the woman is hidden the EO. That's why in alchemy, there's always different symbolism related with EO, related with the moon and the sun. Adam and Eve, Od and Ov, Yin Yang, Hunapu and Ixbalanke. The different religions have different symbols. Hida and Pingala. So here we find that this transformation that the Yod does through the snack, which is Samech, in Malkut, in Asia, <coughs> is explained in the Bible, Kabbalistically, alchemistically, in different levels. Let us remember, for instance, Noah and the Ark. The story of Noah and the Ark, of course, is not uh, a story that uh, we find only in the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. We find that uh, re uh, a story of the universal flood in different religions. If you read, for instance, the Popol Vuh, it's written there how uh, humanity was destroyed by a, a great universal flood. If you read Greek mythology, you also find the same story. How Diukaleon was saved with uh, his wife Pyrrha from the great deluge. And each one of them had different symbols, alchemically, alchemically speaking, related with this transformation. So when you read the story of Noah and his ark, this is a transformation that the couple has to pass when they know the Archanum, the Ark of the Covenant, which is a secret of alchemy. Many people in different times, different epochs, they're trying to find the famous Ark of Noah in Asia. But obviously, that Ark they never find because that is a symbol. Such an Ark, as is written literally in Genesis, never existed physically. It's a symbol. People, of course, that ignore the symbols of alchemy and Kabbalah, they think that was really an ark. Let us remember that at that age, when that supposed ark was built, physically, there were in the earth dinosaurs. Only a couple of those dinosaurs will be enough, or will be enough in order to sink that ark into the bottom of the ocean. Only a couple of them. What about a couple of all the rest of the animals? So we have to study, of course, Kabbalistically that thing, that, but this lecture is not related with it. Just mention it. That that universal flood is related with uh, different cataclysms that happened 
in the Atlantean epoch. The Atlantean civilization, Moses called it Egypt. Or to be more specific, Mazarim. This word begins with M and ends with M. Or we will say it begins with Mem and ends with Mem. And between the two Mems, there is a word Sari, which is that moist or smoked or offering related with the balsam tree, which hides the meaning of Atlantis. Because the Atlantean civilization were children of the mist, which are very clear uh, referred in the opera of Wagner, the ring of the Nibelungen, or the ring of the children of the mist, which were the Atlanteans, <coughs> because their atmosphere were more aquos, aquos. Equus, let it with water. Equus. Aquos. You understand? More watery. Because uh, the planet at that time was, of course, in constant uh, transformation. It is said that. Uh, the steam of the atmosphere of the Atlantean civilization was going up because of the heat of the fires of the planet in the center. But when where they were touching the cold space, they were returning into the ground. And this is how that civilization, the Atlantean civilization, they didn't have the same kind of atmosphere that we have here, very clear. It was something like when the clouds go down and it's very humid, kind of that type of atmosphere. More, more, that's why it is written uh, that uh, the Atlantean civilization, they were uh, using, uh, how do you call the, the fish gills, like the fish, in order to breed because the, the atmosphere is more, more watery than us, or we breathe air. Or humid. or humid. At that time, many cataclysms happened. Because Atlantis is not like many people think, an island there in Greece. But somebody found an island that is uh, similar to what Plato described in his uh, writings. But the, 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 the right thing is this. Atlantis was a huge continent that existed in what now we name the Atlantean Ocean. Of course, in the beginning of the Atlantean civilization, that continent was uniting the south of the United States, Mexico, the north of South America, with Spain, the north of Africa, and Europe. There was a huge continent. Of course, many cataclysms happened, specifically four cataclysms, in which part of, those, uh, of that land were sinking into the Atlantic, what we call now Atlantic uh, Ocean. And precisely, when we read the Bible, we read only about one cataclysm, about one universal flood, because it's referring to the way in which humanity transformed itself in order to become a human being, or saved from the flood of degeneration which is the symbol of it. But of course, when the, the Bible talks about Noah, he appears in the middle of the Atlantean civilization. 
And this, of course, is not uh, at the end. Because every root race, as you know, has seven sub-races. And uh, uh, Noah appears in the fourth sub-race of the Atlantean civilization. I mean, Noah represents, of course, a great master that organized there in the Atlantean civilization a new root race. Because eventually that root race, the great uh, avatars, cosmo creators, angels, archangels, knew very well the transformation of the earth and eventually the whole Atlantis, this whole Atlantean uh, continent will disappear. So they prepared. Why didn't they knew that? Because when Noah appeared in Atlantis, there were already two cataclysms. So the Atlantean continent was not the same when Noah appears. And that's why they knew about the sinking of the continent. The last event of the sinking of that uh, Atlantean continent into the waters of the Atlantean Ocean is written symbolically, alchemically, cabalistically in the departure of Moses with all the Israelites from Egypt. This is something very necessary to understand because Egypt as exists right now I mean, Moses, when he wrote that, is referring to Egypt as Mazarim, which is precisely that land between the waters. Of course, Egypt, as we know it right now, we know very well that existed close to the Nile at that time. But symbolically in different books, we always refer to Mazarim, Egypt, related with the waters. And in Genesis says that the promised land that was going to appear in the future was similar to Egypt or similar to Mazarim. Of course, that's related that uh, the promised land was going to be between the waters as well. But here you find all the symbolism that is hidden within the whole story about the reality, because Atlantean civilization sank into the ocean, which is, in the Bible, Egypt. But the last event I refer, I'm telling you, is when Moses leaves Egypt into the Promised Land, which is precisely the new civilization, the Aryan civilization, in the Gobi Desert, which the Master Samael on the earth explains very in detail in the book... Uh, the revolution of Belzebub. Of course, when Noah appears there at, in the middle of the Atlantean civilization, the Atlanteans were, of course, seen as we see now, the knowledge, the arc of the knowledge that we are teaching now. Noah, that in Sanskrit they call it the Manu Vaisvasvata, was teaching along with many others, great masters, the great arcanum, the great knowledge, in order to save the souls. So, he was building the ark, but it was a great army, a great army of Atlantean people, which were, of course, the Shemites. Who were the Shemites? Shemites were the crossing of the fourth uh, sub-race of the Atlantean civilization with the Hyperboreans. They were the Hyperboreans living in the north of Europe, which were, of course, at that time, survivors of the previous root races of the earth. And the White Lodge selected the Hyperboreans in order to cross them with the Atlanteans in the fourth sub-race. And from that, which is the symbol of Noah, came Shem, 
the Shemites, but other two are the other sub races that existed in the Atlantean civilization. Of course, at that time, with the knowledge, many souls were being transformed in the earth, in Malkut, in Egypt, in Atlantis, because they were promised to them a new land. And they were arriving in that new land with the working, with the work in, in themselves. The new land, of course, is the land of Malkut, but not in the lower level in which we are right now. Because let us look right now, for instance, we are in Malkut, in the three-dimensional world. But if we examine the laws that control this Malkut in this very moment, we discover that this Malkut is controlled by 96 laws. Normally, the world of Asia, Malkut, is controlled by 48. You know that. But 96 is related with the first layer of hell, the first layer of Klipoth, Limbo. So we are in Malkut, but related with Limbo. The Bible refers to those areas of Klipoth in Genesis as Sodom and Gomorrah, which are cities of, we said, civilization that existed in the past as well, but who vibrated not with Malkut as it should be, but with the Klipoth as we are right now. This whole civilization of the earth is a so sodomist civilization, a Gomorrah civilization. Because Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities that were, of course, practicing degeneration, specifically sexual degeneration. And if you see everywhere in this day and age, we are in this two-dimensional world, but we are not governed by uh, 48 laws, but 96, which is limbo. Where fornication and adultery is normal, is a law. Nobody scandals in hell when somebody is an adulterer or a fornicator, it's normal. But here, above Malkut, in the tree of life, fornication and adultery is a sin. Nobody can enter there if it's an adulterer or a fornicator have any sexual degeneration. In order to enter there, the great universal flood has to come and to kill all of those unfaithful ones, which is something, a work that we have to perform in each one of us. So now we are, of course, symbolically speaking, as we said in many other lectures, in Egypt, which is a land which is between the waters, but filthy waters. This is a flood of negative forces. This is why we have to understand. Remember that it's written that in the time of Noah, when he saved himself with his family, which means with the salvation army that he formed in the Atlantean civilization, because through the ark he formed it. When he arrived at the valley of Shinar, or what we say at the Mount Hararat, which is something symbolic related with, the, with Keter, the top of the tree of life is Ararat, top of the head, is where the energies had to rise, to go up in order to be saved. Esoterically speaking. But there were people, it's written there after Noah organized all of the Salvation Army and saved himself and all the people that were following him, practicing the great Arcanum. There were people that were gathering and they were building a tower, which is called the Tower of Babel, Tower of Babel. 
Babel, of course, is the way in which people try to save themselves in the wrong way. Thinking that by building this, by building that, they will be saved by the universal flood. So you see, for instance, that most of the Atlantean buildings were made in the shape of pyramids. Because at that time, there were a lot of floods. And the pyramid buildings are made in that way, not only, of course, in the esoteric meaning of it, but in the way that the water can come up and down and to be saved. Because the atmosphere, I, I repeat, was not as this atmosphere that we have now. So the Tower of Babel is also related as a pyramid building. In order to reach heaven, in order to be saved from the floods, because at the time after uh, Noah formed the Universal uh, uh, the Salvation Army at that time, there were already, I repeat, like three floods or three sinkings of Atlantis. It is written that uh, the last one up, uh, happened approximately 80,000 years ago, which is the sinking of Poseidonis, which is the island which was in the Atlantic Ocean, was the last remnants of the Atlantean civilization. So, of course, from that uh, story of the Valley of Shinar, where the people of Babel were building towers, comes the story of Abraham. Abraham appears there. And from Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob, then Joseph, and they go into Egypt. Which is precisely, we will say, the different steps of the different races. Because Abraham came from the city of Ur, Ur, which was a Chaldean civilization. Because from the Shemites came the Chaldeans, from the Chaldeans, the Hebrews, from the Hebrews, the Israelites, or the Jews now. But not only them, but all the whole civilization, the Aryan civilization. This is how it's described in the Bible. So, when the Israelites, we will say, were the, the, the last remnants of the Atlanteans, or the sub-race, arrived to Egypt, according to the Bible, at that time, was precisely when that was Poseidonis. Matsarim, we will say, in which Moses arrived and takes people into the Gobi Desert. Not only him, but all the great avatars, all the great messengers that were guiding uh, forces in, in, at that time in Malkut, in order to form the present civilization. So as you see there, the story written in the Bible about the universal flood has to be read related with four great floods. Because Noah in the ark is related with the third flood in which the people were being organized and forming the root for the next root race, which is our present Aryan race. And that time is when they received the commandment not to mix with the other races of the Atlantean civilization. Or as the Bible says, with the Egyptians. So the Shemites were not crossing themselves with the other Atlantean sub-races. Or the Shemites. But when the last universal flood came and they emigrated to Europe, or what we say specifically to Asia, to the Gobi Desert, then they were commanded to cross themselves with the different uh, survivors in order to form the Aryan race. And this is how the story of the, the Bible talks. 
which of course has also a Kabbalistic meaning of Abraham, Isaac, because in every step, as you see, you find that Abraham has a daughter, I mean a son, with an Egyptian slave, Agar, which is the duality there of the, of the doctrine. Then, when Abraham has a son, which was named Isaac, which is a symbol of the spinal column, the fire that rises there, Isaac had two children, Jacob and Esau. You see the duality then there, which is Kabbalistically speaking, of course, in the tree of life. Then you find that uh, Jacob is the one that has the 12 tribes of Israel, which is related, of course, with Malkut. Because the, the 12 tribes of Israel are related with the 12 zodiacal signs through which the souls enter into this world. At that time, that's why when you read the Bible, the Bible refers to the world of Malkut at Mazarim. Because Mazarim, Egypt, was at that time the civilization that governed the whole planet, which was the Atlantean civilization. It is necessary to understand that in order to stop uh, referring uh, as Egypt, whatever, as we know it in this Aryan race. Because then there is a lot of controversy ab ab about the meaning of it or the origin of what the Bible says in relation with it. What the Bible states in Genesis is, is in relation with many sub-races, many root races in the past. Evolution and involution of forces. Not only with this Aryan race, which has started after the universal flood, the last universal flood, which symbolically, I repeat, is explained in the Bible with Moses living in Egypt, finally, you know, and to establish a root race. And... Uh, Malkut, which is precisely uh, the Sephira related with the tenth uh, uh, card. And what you find there, that above it, is a symbol of uh, the Sphinx, which was a symbol which was very known in ancient Atlantis. It's an Atlantean symbol. Inherited by the actual Egypt. Why? Because Egypt was one of the cities, or we will say one of the areas that belonged to Atlantis. There were some uh, lands of Atlantis that didn't sink. Egypt was one of them. Spain was one of them. Mexico was one of them. And that's why you find the similitude between Egypt uh, and uh, Mexico, and really with pyramids. But uh, Spain, for instance, is part of Atlantis. So that's why if you want to find uh, remnants from the cities of Atlantis, you will find it there in the very bottom of the oceans of Portugal and Spain. Because Spain itself, I repeat. And that's why the so-called gypsies are, for instance, the remnants, of course, I said, of the Egyptians which are everywhere. So above, you see uh, that above this wheel of Ezekiel, or the wheel of Pythagoras, which symbolizes precisely the wheel of Sanzara, that we have to go out of it, is precisely the symbol of Egypt, the Malkut related with the negative forces of Klippoth. And in order to go out of there, we have to work with the Sphinx. The Sphinx, of course, is a symbol of the four elements that express through the power of the staff or the sword, which is between the two paths of the Sphinx. When you study the will of Ezekiel, you find that Ezekiel describes the four creatures. 
Chayot HaKadosh, which are precisely where the letter Yod or, or the forces of Keter work. The wings of the Sphinx symbolizes the element air. The face of a human being symbolizes the water. Because the human being comes from the water of Yesod. Then the legs of the bull represents the earth and the paws of a lion, the fire. Those are the four elements. And those four elements, of course, are related in different symbols. Not only in the will of Ezekiel, but in, in Pythagoras, the will of Pythagoras, or as we put in the website, the Aztec calendar, which in the middle of it, you find a symbol of the yod, or the face, which is always because Keter is related with the head, with the face. And around it, you find, of course, the four elements, or the four sub -race, uh, root races, that rotate in the Nawiolin. The Nawiolin is that precisely uh, Aztec swastika that rotates in order to originate the universe according to the cosmology of the Nagua in Mexico. So that's precisely the great symbol, the four elements rotating in the wheel of Zamzara that we had to control. And in order to control, we had to build the vehicles in order to go out of it. But before that, we had to defeat Egypt. Or as uh, the book of Revelation says, we had to defeat the great Babylon. This is another symbol here that we have to specify. We had to stop referring at the people of Iraq as the people that deserve to be punished because it's the old Babylon. When the Bible talks about Babylon, esoterically speaking, let me tell you, Kabbalistically, alchemically, how it is referred to it. When in the beginning of the creation of this planet, or this four round, terrestrial round, people still didn't, uh, as you said, observe the physical world through the five senses. In the same way that people right now have atrophied their internal senses, and they cannot see the fourth dimension, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh, and they think that everything which is above Malkut, the higher dimensions, is just an illusion, something that uh, only the crazy people think about, or are belief, because they don't have the senses. At that time, before the earth became crystallized in the three-dimensional world, people also were not crystallized in the three-dimensional world. Because you have to understand that the planet Earth, Malkut, is called the kingdom. Why is it called the kingdom? Because it has mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, human kingdom, and animal kingdom. So the whole kingdoms are for Malkut. So each one of the kingdoms, mineral, plant, animal, and human, are also in the same level in which the planet is as we are right now. So at that time, before the crystallization of the matter into the three-dimensional world, people had physical bodies, but they didn't uh, uh, receive the three-dimensional world in the same way that we don't receive the internal dimensions right now. They were there, but they didn't receive it. That is the story precisely of Adam and Eve. At that time, they were dying. But they were, not so, they were not aware of the three-dimensional world that they were living their bodies and they were more in tune with the internal worlds that they didn't care. You see? You understand that? Do you, do you follow me? Because the sight, the smell, and all the senses of the physical world, of the physical body, were not fully developed as we have right now developed. Now we perceive the physical world complete we will say more or less complete because there are some things that we don't see in this three-dimensional world that they are obvious. But at that time, Adam and Eve, who were the symbol of the Lemurian continent in which 
the earth started to crystallize in a two-dimensional world. So that time the Lemurians, we were before the Atlanteans, were more inside than outside. More in the internal worlds than in Malkut. And that's why they, they didn't care. I mean, they were not so concerned with death. Then, the great cosmo creators were concerned with it. Because little by little, Lemurians were aware that they, were, they had to develop the physical senses in order to be aware of the three-dimensional world according to the law of involution, the dissension of the ray of creation. And what happened? That many discovered that finally the planet was reaching the bottom of the, of the apex of the rounds, finally. And eventually it has to go up in order to return the energy. But those monads that will not do that, they will be identified with the physical world and therefore they will be in, a, in the will of Zamzara identify and will go down in devolution and again in evolution again in devolution and evolution as you know the will of samsara so they were saying why are we in this level right now eventually we will see the physical world but we don't want it's better if we disappear we don't exist because now we are reaching the very bottom and if we don't succeed in returning into the higher levels we will be lost in Klippoth. And that's precisely the meaning that says that many one trying to commit suicide. Because for there, the physical body was nothing. They were more in tune with the internal world. Then the ghost cosmo creators came. And you know the story. Sakaki, Loisos, and all of them, in order to implant in them the Kundavafer organ, which is the organ that helps to crystallize and to go down in order to see the physical world. And that Kundavafer organ is related with the letter Tet, with Lucifer, the tempter. At that time, humanity didn't know fornication. And was that, of course, to implant the Kundavafer organ in order for Tet, which is related with the sense of taste, hmm? related with the mouth, taste. You know, you, we already explained that. In Yod, because Yod is in relation with a sexual organ hidden within Tet. So behold here the two senses, touch and taste. That's why it is written, when the serpent gave to Eve, which is a serpent related with procreation, Eve tasted. Huh? Because the serpent is in relation with the sense of taste. And that's why when you move the tongue or when somebody wants to imitate a serpent, it takes the tongue out. All this serpentine. Right? The taste. But that taste is given through the sex. Touch. Because the organ that is in relation with the sense of touch is a sexual organ. It's a more sensitive. So we hold there. And this is why after that eating of that forbidden fruit, which is sex, the senses of the physical world, you know, Eve helps Adam, and Adam, the brain, develops here on the head. The smell, the sight, the ears, everything up here. That's why in the head, right? And, and start perceiving the physical world. So that's why it said, and their eyes were open. And not only their eyes, their nose, their ears, every, all the senses, and they per start perceiving more the three-dimensional world. But unfortunately, as you know, the big mistake in the practice of fornication that some of them, they didn't return after the development, because the Kundabafer organ was a necessity at that time. And it's a necessity because the souls, the monads, need to know good and evil. 
but at a certain limit in order to return it to become as gods, knowing good and evil. But there was a big mistake, a miscalculation, and the Kundabafer organ was for a long time, which is the tale of Satan. And humanity, instead of returning and, and acquiring knowledge of good and evil, they keep fornicating and degenerating themselves. So then, they were building in their brain the great Babylon. Do you understand that? That's why it is written that the great Babylon is seated in seven hills. These are precisely two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, and the mouth. Here. Above them is a brain that receives all the information, all the impressions from the physical world in order to build that sinful mind that we have, which is identified with desire. Because we have to conquer desire in order to become gods. Nobody comes an angel or transforms himself into a true human being if he or she doesn't conquer desire. God, the last given by ancient avatars and patriarchs give certain ways in order for you to stop abusing of desire, especially sexual desire, in order to develop, according to the evolution, your brain. But the real objective of evolution is to create objective reasoning, which is through chastity. But now, everybody has Iraq, Babylon, in their head, in their brain. So Babylon is not only in Iraq. Babylon is in the whole earth. That's why it's calling that in the book of Revelation is Babylon the great. The great harlot. Whose number is 666. It's not a certain person as many people think. It's all people. This is the mind that we built since that time of Lemuria until this moment. The great avatars are sending messengers, great uh, angels, to fight against Babylon. And of course, religious people in this day and age, they think that they are very good, and they are just pointing uh, Babylon there in Iraq. Poor people that are also from Babylon as well, but we are also from Babylon. Meanwhile, Eden, that garden that is written in the Bible, symbolically, is it's written that was between the Euphrates and the Tigris, the rivers in Asia, that in Iraq. So how come Eden is also there? It's a symbol that we have to understand and comprehend. And of course, in other lectures we say, well... The seven hills of, upon which the great whore is seated are the seven capital sins. Yes, of course. Beginning with lust, without origin, the origin, you see, I'm telling you, the touch and taste of the serpent giving you lust. And from there come the other senses developed through which we feed pride, anger, greed, gluttony, laziness, which is the outcome of the wrong transformation of impressions. The outcome of desire, which is fed always through the five senses. So do you understand that? Do you follow what I'm explaining here? Because it's related precisely with the creation, the way of creation in Malkut. The way in which evolution and involution Transform the forces in different rounds in order for the monad to acquire mastery. Because our monad, our own particular individual Jehovah, our own particular Elohim, because each one of us has his own particular Jehovah. There is not one Jehovah. There are many Jehovahs as people in the earth. There are many Elohim as people in the earth. But they need to conquer. They need to conquer the earth. 
They need to conquer the Matharim. That's why it's written that when Moses, which was a great avatar at that time, when going into the world of Atiluth, appears before him, Keter. But hidden in the burning bush, which is Da'at, because this is how he expresses. And what is your name? And then his particular individual Elohim said to him, Eheye Asher Eheye. Translation is, I am the one that am. Not as the Bible says, I am the one that I am. I am the one that I am, because I am not that. He is the one that is. It is sent to the people, and in his sense, Moses to Mazarin, which is between the waters. At that time, Poseidonis, Atlantis. Because precisely the great civilization of, uh, of that uh, uh, moment was in Kali Yuga. You know very well that every root race has four yugas. And Kali Yuga is the last yuga, where the people degenerate. So Atlantean civilization in the beginning was, of course, beautiful. But in the time of Moses, was the Kali Yuga. And all the great symbols and religions of Egypt were degenerated already. Nonetheless, Moses studied in Egypt. Meaning, he nourished himself with the doctrine of the Atlanteans, which is a pure Kabbalah. Because now, let me tell you another thing. The Atlanteans and the Mayans are the same as well. Mayans and Atlanteans, no difference. It's just a matter of language. So that Kabbalah, he nourished himself with Kabbalah there. Because all the symbols that Moses used are Egyptian symbols. Of course, if you study those symbols in the dead letter, you don't find similitude. But when you go deep down into the symbol of the Egyptians, this is Moses. This is the whole doctrine there. But apply in different way, according to his own knowledge. Because he was one of the founders. He was the first one that wrote the story of this Aryan race. And is written in the Bible. And that book is called Genesis. And the last one that wrote according to this transformation was John the Divine, the book of Revelation. Which is a Kabbalistic book. It's related with the same thing. Now, as repeating the same words of Moses, we have to go out of Mazarim. We have to go out of Babylon the Great. But that is not, of course, Outside of us. It's inside of us. And the only one that can take us out of there is Keter, the Yod. Because he is the one that nothing is moving into the will of Sansara without the will of Yod, Keter. Without the will of the Father. That's his law. And that's why he controlled the law. The Pharaoh, they say. But it's a symbol. The minister, which is the ego, of course, inside of us. It's that intellect that we have. That's the Pharaoh. He has to come there and to transform, to teach us. And then we have to defeat the Pharaoh by doing the ten wonders that Moses did. Because if you read the wonders that Moses did before leaving Matfaim, Egypt, Malkut, he did ten. Related with the tree of life. And that's why Yod is, relation, is in relation with the touch, with the hand that touches. <clears throat> hmm? Do you remember in this moment, for instance, Michelangelo? He painted how God was making Adam. And if you trace a sign of the infinite, 
between God and Adam and the 16th chapel, you will find the Holy Eight. And that's precisely the symbol of how the Yod creates because it's two hands touching. One that gives and the other receives. But this God of Michelangelo is not by himself. Michelangelo painted an Elohim. Of course, he's an old man there, but he is carried by cherubim, seraphims around him. Do you, do you know? You remember that, right? You see that picture. There are many angels there around. There are many. There's no one. It's Elohim. The only that is one is Adam. So the Elohim are the one that, in that sign of the infinite, create Adam. Because there are many. In other words, that's why it's written that El, God, expresses through the Elohim. And in the middle of the Elohim, he judges. Because every Elohim in itself, every angel, every God, has a spinal column. And Yod, which is a sexual force in Malkut, has to rise in order to make the letter Bav in the spinal column. And this is how the Yod, Keter, is in the middle of the spinal column of the Elohim, the gods and goddesses. And in the middle of them, he judges. Meaning Keter is everywhere and every single god. Whether he is from the Hebrew pantheon, whether for the Hindu pantheon, from the Mayan, Aztec pantheon, from the Egyptian pantheon, Keter, the Yod, is the origin of the fire that gives power in each one of them. But we are following Elohim. Or in other words, our own particular monad still needs to work with the Sphinx, which is the symbol of the forces of the elements. It is written that in the temple of the Sphinx, there's a great ordeal that any initiate that enters into that Sphinx, which still exists, let me tell you, but not physically, but in the internal worlds. If you go on the astral plane, you find that temple. And anyone that enters there has to pass the ordeal uh, of the sanctuary. What is that ordeal of sanctuary? That ordeal of the sanctuary encompasses all of the ordeals that you experience during the self-realization. That's why it's written that if you pass the ordeal of the sanctuary, you receive the seal of Solomon, which means the self-realization of your being. But for that, as Moses controlled the four elements, you have to control the four elements. But no one can control the four elements outside if you don't control them inside. The voluptuous hondings are related with your sexual waters. The salamanders of fire are related with your anger, with your hatred, with your envy. All of those desires and the solar plex that you have to transform into virtues. But if you are always angry, always envious, always greedy, always dam damning everybody, you are a slave of the salamanders. Because anger is a frustrated desire. And if you are lazy, you want to be saved only by raising your arm, that's laziness. You have to do work. You have to be practical. So you are a slave of the gnomes. Because the gnomes are diligent. They are the ones that transmute the lead in the planet Earth into gold. And all the transformation they do in the, in the mineral kingdom made by the gnomes. We have to imitate the gnomes in order to be diligent. Alchemists. Moment after moment. And, of course, if we are a slave of Babylon, our own thoughts, our own intellect. We are not controlling the air. In order to control the air, also we control in the way that we speak, we talk. Because according to our thoughts, as are what we talk. So you realize that the four elements are within. We have to control them. 
And for that, we need willpower. That willpower is symbolized by the staff in the middle of the path, which could be also a sword. Willpower. And that willpower is also related with Moses. His willpower. But not that selfish willpower that we have here. Because Moses came from Sinai, obeying Yod, obeying Keter. He says, go and I will be with you. So everything that Moses did in Mazarim, in Malkut, in order to liberate the forces of his unconsciousness, was thanks to Elohim, his own particular Yod force, which was in the spinal column, which was the serpent Nahash. So everything that he does is because of the serpent, is because of Yod, is because of Tet. And he succeeds. This is the same that we have to do. To work with. And that is hidden in the Yod. The whole work is hidden in Eol. The number 10. Do you have questions? The only one that is perfect is Keter, Yod. It's the only one that is perfect. When one succeeds and performs the work of Moses, or the work of Buddha, or the work of Jesus, of course, you become an angel. And finally, the higher level is a cosmo creator. Those cosmo creators receive different levels of objective reasoning. What is the objective reasoning? The way in which an angel, an archangel, a cosmic creator, expresses the wisdom of Keter, or develops. So any cosmic creator has different degree of objective reasoning. There are six degrees. The higher degrees is unclad. So in the cosmos, cosmic creators help in creation. That's why it's called cosmic creation. But every planet has different karma. When at that time in Lemuria, humanity started thinking in what I explained to commit suicide in masses, a cosmo creator was sent here in order to fix the problem and to help humanity to really see the three-dimensional world in order to keep ahead with their evolution in the fourth round. Sakaki came which is a cosmo creator, and did his job. But it was not the first time that he did it. He did it many times, in different planets. In other words, he was skillful in that. But when he arrived to the planet Earth, he forgot his inner being. In other words, he didn't consult his Keter. Because this planet Earth has different karma. The three previous rounds of this planet Earth has a lot of karma. And Sakaki didn't take into account that. Because he did many times, so another time, it's okay. If he would consult his inner being, his Keter, Keter would have said, wait a minute, my son, you are accustomed to do this, you help this planet, this other planet, but this planet Earth is different. Study the previous rounds, and you will say, you will see that here you will apply the same thing, but not so long, like in the other planets. But he didn't consult his inner being, his Keter. You see, you realize that? You understand that? You comprehend that? That Keter is all knowing, but sometimes you can do things willingly without thinking that you are doing bad. And that will happen with Sakaki. He committed a mistake. If he will consult his inner being, he wouldn't commit that mistake. But he did it because he forgot his inner being. That's why it is written that Master Jesus, when he received the mission that he was going to perform on the planet Earth, he realizes the great responsibility. And he said, Father, if it's possible, 
take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine be done. That's the thing that we have to do always. But that's why he committed that mistake. He left the Kundabafe organ too long. And the outcome, the results were what we see already here. It's a great problem. That's why many avatars, many messengers were sent to the planet Earth in order to fix the problem. Because the amount of ego that we have is too much. Normally, humanity is, it says, uh, is written, they uh, uh, create like 10% of ego, as much. So then they go around and along with the other civilizations, other planetary humanities. But in the planet Earth, it is overwhelming. It's 97% of ego. So that's why we are like excluded from the planetary civilizations. They visit us. They observe us. But they realize that we are dangerous. The queen, we can infect other civilizations easily. As we, uh, as the Europeans, infected the Mayans when they came here. Mayans were, of course, with ego, but they didn't have diseases. They didn't have all the problems that now this America civilization have because of the Europeans. They brought even syphilis that was unknown in, the, in, the, in America. So in the same way, that's why the great mistake committed in this planet is, of course, uh, trying to be resolved. And this is why uh, there's a big problem here. Well, uh, the well beyond Keter, of course, is the absolute, which is perfect, right? But as I'm telling you, when you forget that you have a being and because you are accustomed to do things good, you commit mistakes. Of course, uh, many avatars and, and the great messenger that came that is above all of them is the Master Jesus, Master Averamento who is not a cosmo creator, he is a Paramartha Satya. He is already a, an inhabitant of the Ain. And he came. And he's there, still with the earth, because he's still alive. He's a resurrected master, as many other masters. But according to the pyramid of initiates, Jesus is on top. After him, below, is Buddha Sakyamuni. And many others. Yes? It takes everything since you started. Uh, what about the ordeal of the sanctuary? Says, can you explain about it? Yes. The ordeal of the sanctuary begins with public lectures. You hear the lectures, you follow the doctrine. You start practicing, and when you self-realize yourself, you resurrect from the dead, that's the end of your deal. It takes all your deals. How many? As many as you passed. Yeah? Well, in order to develop the Kunda buffer, they had to fornicate, right? Of course, there is a certain limit, I mean, because a Kunda buffer only develops when you crystallize the energy in the wrong way. So that's the way in order to, to fall, because your Malkut is a fallen Sephira. But in order to, to return, because it is a necessity of the involving ray of creation, because if you don't know evil, how are you going to become a god? How are you going to return into the absolute without knowing evil? You have to know the two. We will say the two forces of evolution and involution. Because good and evil are really two words that are very are, are placed in the wrong way. Right? Obviously, other humanities received the Kundavafer organ and they obtained the knowledge of good and evil without so much hazards. But here in the planet Earth, still, People like to know more evil and more evil, and they worship evil. 
or worship the involution. There's a lot of people there that are in, like, in the time of Atlantis as well. And it's because precisely because the karma, the karma that we have is so heavy that since Lemuria, they sank into Klippoth. In Atlantis, they sank into Klippoth. And now, this humanity, a whole humanity is in Klippoth. We are in Malkut physically, but our psyche belongs to Klippoth. And we need to make a great revolution, transformation. We have to annihilate and to, to study the book of Revelation that explains the steps in order to annihilate Babylon the Great, the harlot that we have in the head. And there's a transformation, yeah? The thing is that in any planet, planet needs solar vibrations and lunar vibrations. That's why I have four kingdoms. You see, for instance, the plant kingdom, the mineral kingdom, they don't have body of desire. But the body of desire started to develop in the animals. And that body of desire is built by nature in the animals in order to crystallize the lunar vibrations that help the inner layers of the planet to, to stabilize. When we enter into the human kingdom, we are still animals. A human being doesn't fornicate, doesn't spill the semen. Only an animal does it. Because that crystallizes. But because when you continue like that, you have to stop being an animal and to continue and to make the transmutation of the forces in order to go up according to the ray of creation, to return, as we explain in Zain, letter Zain, to return the energy. But we don't do it. Obviously, we continue sinking into Klippoth and fortifying the ego, the animal ego, which is overwhelmingly strong in each one of us in Klippoth. Yes? What kind of karma has the cat you received for leaving your kingdom on for too long? Well, that, what kind of karma has Sakaki for the, leaving the Kunabafer organ so long on the planet Earth? Well, that's a, a karma called katansia. Katansia is a superior karma related with the gods, related with the cosmos creator, with the angels. And obviously, he has to pay that in the next cosmic day, or Maha Mambantara. This is a problem with the gods, among the gods. But he has to pay it, of course, because nobody can mock the law. That's why we have to be careful what we will say, what we teach, because this is related with katansia. Yes? Can you elaborate about the Elohim of each one of us? How do we each have our own? Well, because Elohim means gods and goddesses. And uh, why, the question is, how do we elaborate about uh, the Elohim on each one of us? We elaborate that with the tree of life. Remember that the tree of life is a symbol that explains the whole cosmos, the creation, the evolution of the planets and the planet Earth, and as well, our own particular individuality. Elohim is many, and we have our own particular Elohim, Keter, Chokmah, Binah. There are three gods and one God, as Christianity says, or three forces and one force. But really, Keter is three, the crowned. Keter is seven in relation with the cosmo creators, the law of seven, the law of epta, para, par, she, knock. Twelve. Keter is also twelve, related with the bottom. Here especially, because in Malkut, everybody enters through Yod into the world. Isn't it that we come from the phallus of our father, the Yod of our father? In Malkut, is the woman, the mother, the mother. You see, even the word mater comes from mother in Latin. So the woman receives the yod of the man. And in her womb, nine months in the ninth sphere, in Malkut, she creates and delivers. So creation is between yod and he, or eo, in other words. And... That's, of course, that the Yod brings souls into the 12 constellations. 
because each one of us is related to any zodiacal sign, 12 signs. These are the 12 tribes of Israel. So behold, God is also related, related with 12 and related with 24, the 24 elders of the book of Revelation. So, Yod is also very 48. Yod is everywhere because God is everywhere. Mm -hmm. In synthesis, we will say everything is in Yod, but in potency. But God, Yod, is an activity in few of his creations. Only those that self-realize Yod. And that is Elohim. Elohim is within and without. Inside and out. Do you have any other question? What are the levels of being? The levels of being. The levels of being are related with that, that we are explaining here. The higher level is the level of Ishmech, or as we said, the unclad level, in which we really attain a lot of objective reasoning. The lower level, well, is we. We are in the lower level, trying to understand. Yeah, at that time, Northern Africa was the coast of Atlantis. South Africa was part of it, but not the most, most of the continent of, uh, of uh, uh, Africa was in the ocean, sinking in the ocean, on the bottom of the ocean. So at the time of Atlantis, Spain uh, was the coast of Atlantis, as well as uh, Egypt, as well as Mexico, were the coast of them, with the sinking of Atlantis, then the, the land changed. Many lands emerged and formed the great continent of Africa and America as well, because at that time, South America was only the north of South America. But with the emerging came uh, Argentina, for instance, Brazil, where you find the big jungles and many other lands that were before in the bottom of the ocean. So the geography or the physiognomy of the earth was not the same. It's changing always. Yeah, in the type of the mountains of the Spain, you find seashells. And many other places, you, you, you find with things because of the earth. And uh, as well, not only that those lands were the coast of the great continent, but as well, the axis of the earth were different. What, what now is poles were Ecuador. And what now is Ecuador were poles. Equator. The equator was the poles, and the poles were the equator. And the Himalayas mountain, also you find, you see, those seas, seashells, many sea creatures, yeah? Um, regarding control, um, some control ratios, uh, what interested me was when you said that you need to control the elements within you first. Mm -hmm. In order, how do yeah, control yeah. The question is, how do we control what we talk, what we say, in order to uh, control ourselves? Well, that implies a lot of meditation, because you have to, to to learn how to hear your intuition. The intuition is the voice of your inner monad, your inner Elohim, your inner Jehovah that is giving you. But for that, you see, for instance, Kabbalah means to receive. You have to learn how to receive the information of your being in order to give it, in order to explain it. And for that, you have to open your heart. 
And that is by remembering God from moment to moment. From second after second. You see, because God is omnipresent. He's hearing now. So that is, God has form and has no form. So then you have to remember that it's within you. Part of that is within you. That's why we said the particles of pain of Keter are within our body, suffering. And that's why Moses is sent to liberate those. But that's willpower that we need in order to exercise that remembrance from moment to moment to our inner God in order to liberate those parts. And by listening to our inner Elohim, by meditating and by awakening the consciousness, is how we learn what to say. The moment in which we have to be silent. The moment in which we want to speak. If you follow that, you know the moment in which you do charity. And when you shouldn't do charity. Because God knows everything. Unfortunately, we listen always to Babylon, the great. She's the mind. And makes a mess of everything. Time doesn't exist as we understand it. We have to be here and now. Not in the past, not in the future. Here and now. Because God is always there in the present. It's a continuous active of life that enters through your senses. That needs to be transformed. But unfortunately, we are slaves of time. Which is our mind. We always remember, you see, time is related with traditions. Customs. All that that we have in the mind. People, for instance, are afraid to enter into the path because they have to renounce their race, their blood. Many things. That's why we have in the physical body two types of blood. The venom. Venom is called, right? Blood, which is the impure blood. Venus. Venus. It's impure blood that is created in the liver. You see, the liver is where we have in the fish, the animal appetites. So there where the blood is created. And this is how we behave animalistically. But thanks to nous, which is in the left ventricle of the heart, which is the atom that obeys the inner God, where the intuition is, purifies the blood by sending the impure blood in the heart to the lungs. And then we purify, well, we purify, but now we have made of the atmosphere a, a filthy thing, a filthy filter. You know, it's a smog. We should go, for instance, to the forest and only to purify with pure oxygen. Because we excel poison, which the plant takes and transforms into oxygen. You see, we excel poison because we are full of poison and we breathe the oxygen that the plants give. In order to purify the blood. That purification is an action of Aleph, which is the wind, the air, the Ruach. And the blood circulates after that. But we always divide it into impure blood and good blood. So therefore, we have to work in a self realization until the whole blood is purified. And that is only done by the fire, which is, of course, Christ. It's a transformation of alchemy. Yeah. What is the relationship between our Elohim and the Cosmo Creator? Our Elohim. No, Elohim. Our. Our Elohim. And the Cosmo Creator. Well, uh, the Cosmo Creators are angels or archangels or are monads which are in contact, directly in contact with the angels of Or. Which is the source of life from the absolute. Our Elohim is also in contact with the ends of through the cosmic creators. So the Elohim, in other words, our own particular Elohim, belongs to a ray. And that ray is a cosmic creator that is in contact with the same O and self or. We depend of it. We have, of course. To transform ourselves in order to be directly dependent from the ends of or. But that implies self-realization of the being. That's a great work. 
Meanwhile, before reaching that level, we depend of the cosmic creators. We depend on the angels, which are above our Elohim. Because all of us are fallen. Any fornicator is Elohim, is a failure. Anyone that self realizes his Elohim is a conqueror. The monads of this planet Earth are failures. Because most of the people here are fornicators. And thank you very much. Next lecture will be the 11th Arcanum. Have a nice weekend. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,